Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. So imagine you have an asshole like me that isn't building up any relational equity and I'm making decisions to hire people like this. Clearly, it makes it look like I don't know what I'm doing. And to be frank, I don't think I knew what I was doing. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And this is after I took over. So, you know, the other four partners were out. We dropped all the way down to one full-time employee. And I was really confident just giving it all up. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. So welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. Today, I'm interviewing Eric Sue, CEO of Single Grain. Single Grain is a digital marketing agency focused on driving scalable and predictable revenue growth using Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube, SEO, and content marketing. They worked with companies like Uber, Amazon, and Salesforce. Last year, they generated $2 million in revenue, and they're on track for $4 million this year. I'm very excited to interview Eric today because he's one of the few agencies where they actually do marketing really well for themselves. So I'm really excited to talk about his journey to seven figures. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right. So Eric, let's back it up a little bit. So one of the interesting things I found when researching you is that you had about nine jobs with like less than a year of experience. And so for me, like if I was looking to like hire someone like you, if I saw your resume, that'd be a big red flag that comes through like this person can't stay in one position. So maybe you want to talk about kind of like your experience going from job to job and how you worked at Treehouse for a short time and then eventually took the role with Single Grain. Yeah, I think the calling card for an entrepreneur is someone that isn't able to hold a job for a long time. They're just not, they're fundamentally not employable. But growing up, I was always taught coming from my Asian parents to you know hold a job for a long time. But for whatever reason, it just didn't really jive with me. Like I got bored really quickly. And my main thing with changing jobs, and I recommend this to everyone else that is have a full-time job right now is chase the opportunity. It's not so much chase the money. If you see a good opportunity pop up, go ahead and take it. Go ahead and take the next one. And every single time I interviewed for another job, they always asked me why I kept jumping around. And I just said I was chasing the next opportunity and that stopped them in the tracks. And I got the job every single time. So as long as you're constantly trying to grow yourself, people are going to respect that. And the same applies to whatever you do for the rest of your life. Hmm, Interesting. Okay. So like, let's talk about Treehouse for a second. So we interviewed Ryan Carson on a previous episode. I think you introduced him to my business partner, Donaberry. Yep. So yeah, what was that experience like with them? And then you moved on to single grain pretty quickly after that. Yeah, that was interesting. So at Collision Conference, I hosted a dinner with your co-founder and then also Ryan, and that's how they met up. But anyway, Treehouse was really good. I mean, it taught me of seeing a company where the talent was exceptional, the CEO was great as well, and then the whole mission was great. So just having something I could stand behind, that really opened my eyes up to, you know, this is the world of tech. And also getting to work remotely and manage a marketing team when I was 25 years old, that was something that I saw as another big opportunity. I was getting paid well, got stock options. And it was a great challenge also because we only had five months of cash left in the bank. And it was my job to bring everything back and try to get the numbers on board so we could get our Series B around. And we got it just in time. And I had planned to stay at Treehouse for a very long time before my podcast co-host, Neil, was like, hey, why don't you come help try to save this company? So I thought because I acquired the skill or the experience of being able to help a stagnant company, well would I be able to take those skills and translate that into turning a company around? And that's what I thought the challenge was because I was never really interested in single grain as a company because it just really couldn't compare to where Treehouse was at at the moment. But taking on the challenge of turning around a company, I thought would help me a lot for you know the rest of my life. Okay, interesting. So Neil Patel introduced this kind of opportunity to you. What kind of shape was single grain in when you got involved with it? So... Full disclosure, I mean, the whole Google Panda, Google Penguin thing that happened in 2012, 2013 or so, that basically destroyed the business model because Single Grain was based off of doing a lot of SEO work for clients and most of it was link acquisition. So the results were just not hitting anymore. And so you think of it like the entire infrastructure of the company was built on fulfilling those services. When you have something like that not working anymore, it means, okay, layoffs have to happen. All the bad stuff has to happen. So the shape we were in was, uh, to be frank, we were going down <laughs> down and to the right, not up and to the right. And we also had people in the company, like the partners that were, some of them were no longer interested in the agency. So there's a lot of kind of strife. And when sales are happening, things are fine. But when things aren't going well, that's when you start to see uh, a lot of instability. 
Yeah. And I think from previous interviews I've seen, you guys were at about 1.5 million in sales, but you're at a negative profit of about 27,000. Does that sound right? Yeah. So we were at 1.1. And then when I took the company over a year into it, we're at negative 24. All right. Yeah. If you were a healthy 15% profit company, you should have had positive like 225,000 in, in profit just, just to show people the difference. So there's a big swing there. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing like morale was probably not there. Momentum wasn't there. So yeah, you decided to get involved. Like what was that arrangement like when you got pulled into this company? Yeah. So there are four other partners. So I like to say it was one yellow guy and four Indian guys. And so Neil was actually one of the partners. His partner, Heaton Shah, was one of the partners too. And then Sujin, and there's another guy. And we all actually still stay in contact right now. So we're all on good terms. I came in as a 10% guy. And the way that arrangement looked was I came in as a chief operating officer. So the number two. And one of the lessons I learned was that basically, you know, everything that you want to get done in a company is all based off of people. Like whatever you're trying to accomplish your goals, you have to be good with people. And when I came into it, you know, I was very robotic and I came in as kind of the bad cop and I wasn't trying to build relationships with people. I was just trying to, you know, be very methodical about cutting things and then, you know, putting in the right processes and all this kind of stuff. I was just trying to do too many things at once and not building any relationship capital with people. So basically, it's like building a bank account, for example. And I wasn't depositing at my relationship bank account. And basically, I was trying to withdraw all the time. So that's one thing I learned really early. Hmm. What do you mean by that? So I think you're probably like, what, 26 years old at this time? Yes. And you're going through this phase where like, you need to be making cuts, you need to be making tough decisions. So mm-hmm. what do you mean you weren't making the deposits? And how is that actually like affecting like, were people like leaving and quitting because of it? Yeah. Well, let's look at me and you, right? Like you and I, we've met in real life. We've talked before. So we've built up relationship equity, right? Just because we've sure. helped each other out. We've built up a friendship. I'm saying like, it wasn't like Treehouse where I built up relationships with my team. I helped hire the people. I came into a company where I didn't hire the people. I didn't build up any relational equity, yet I was trying to get them to do things when we didn't know each other that well. So that was across the board. And when you try to get things like if I went to someone on the street and asked people to do something, probably wouldn't listen to me, right? Like just if some random guy came up to you and said, Hey, Jeremy, can you help me do this? You would be like, I don't even know you. So that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. All right. So like Eric, what happened? Like you guys are in this position where you're losing money. Do things get better or do things get worse right away? No, things get progressively worse because basically what happened was we're like, okay, well, if this SEO thing isn't going to work, we got to try doing this content marketing thing. And we started to do the content marketing thing, but here's the thing. We did content marketing well for ourselves, but we looked elsewhere and we got a recommendation to hire this one person that was very senior and we ended up making the hire. And I learned very early that you have to vet every single one of your hires, no matter you know how senior they are. I guess I got lucky at Treehouse with all my hires, but you know, made a big blunder here and we ended up losing four clients because this person would actually yell at people during calls. And you know, employees' morale dipped even lower. So imagine you have an asshole like me that isn't building up any relational equity and I'm making decisions to hire people like this. Clearly, it makes it look like I don't know what I'm doing. And to be frank, I don't think I knew what I was doing. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And this is after I took over. So you know, the other four partners were out. We dropped all the way down to one full-time employee. And I was really, really confident just giving it all up. Mm, What revenue were you at when you were down to one employee? So that year when it was really bad, we dropped to like 555K, I think. Okay. Yeah. And that's interesting. I know someone else that's going through the same thing where they hired someone that was senior. They think, you know, just bringing in the senior level talent is going to like upgrade it. And I'm sure that was expensive for you. And it sounds like you didn't bet them out well enough. And that can just put a cancer in your business if it's not the right hire. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not even going to blame that person. I'm going to blame myself because as the leader of the company, it all comes back down to you at the end of the day. So yeah, it's my fault. Every single thing that happens, it's my fault. And you know, the good things that happen, it's because of the team. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so you get down to one full-time employee. You guys are at about $550,000 in revenue. What do you do to start turning things around? Yeah, so I was telling you earlier when we're preparing that I was you know, telling my, po- my now podcast co-host for one of my other podcasts, Neil, I was like, man, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I think I want to you know, try to do some other stuff. And he was like, well, you know, because he was collecting a lot of leads at the time too. He gets a lot of traffic. He's like, well, we started referring stuff to you know, a couple of agencies And I was like, okay, well, that sounds good because we're ranking really highly for a lot of different marketing company keywords. And I just started referring to leads out and using the model that he gave me. And we basically collect 15, 20, even 25% of the lifetime of the customer. And so that's how we started collecting revenue. And that jumped up to, you know, about 
I think 300 to 350k in just affiliate commissions, which is good, but we didn't see it as something that was you know more sustainable for the long term. And why is that? Were you having trouble really vetting out like the people you're referring it to, or what was the issue? So what we saw was that the close rates for these other agencies that a they were lower, b they couldn't retain them for that long, and c the you know average kind of customer value per month was just not that good. So we basically decided that okay, why don't we just try focusing on building a paid advertising agency instead? And then from there, you know, we saw that we improved the number significantly, and then we just started to scale things back up again. Okay, so you decided to shift focuses of like the service offering. Did you guys already have background expertise in paid advertising, or is this something you're figuring out as you went along? Yeah, so to kind of backfill. So yeah, I mean, we did have paid advertising people during the kind of transition to content marketing. So we did have that service already. That was something that we did do content marketing and paid advertising at the same time, but we tried to focus more on content marketing. So mm-hmm. we've had that hanging around. And yeah, I mean, we're like, okay, let's just test it with one full time person. And this was in 2016, by the way. So we started the kind of second coming of single grain around then. Okay. All right. So testing it with one full time person. So, like, what happened? You got some clients that came in, they just wanted paid advertisement. So, you just tested, like, that was the only service you offered them? Yeah. So, we started to focus more just on paid ads. And then we saw that, you know, it just started to stack and, you know, people were a lot happier. The LTV was a lot higher. People were staying for, you know, 12, 18 months, which, versus the past was like three, four months or so. And some are staying even much longer than that. So that to us was a no brainer. Okay. And so how are you getting them to stick for 12 to 18 months? Were you picking like a very specific niche or industry that you guys performed really well in or what were you guys doing? Yeah, great question. So even right now we stick to software as a service companies, education, just because I come from online education and then e-commerce. And then, you know, every now and then like a Uber or like an Amazon or a Lyft will come by and like, sure, we'll take those on. You'll figure it out. (laughs) Yeah, we'll we'll figure it out. And yeah, I mean, so I think if you're starting an agency, I think paid advertising for anybody because of the recurring, it's fantastic. And I think it's like a nice gateway drug into, you know, other services down the road. Okay, awesome. And what kind of like pricing or contracts would you put in place? Yeah. So for us, I mean, even today, I mean, our minimums, it's five grand a month or 15% of ad spend, whichever is higher. And then it goes on a case by case basis. Like if it's a much bigger brand with much larger budgets, we might say, okay, let's bump up the monthly retainer to like, you know, 30 or 40 grand a month or something like that. But yeah. And then budget wise, I mean, our minimums are around 20 to 30 K a month. Awesome. All right. So it sounds like you solved a big problem here. You picked a service you guys are good at. You're getting clients to last a lot longer. You guys have good recurring revenue built in. And those things all sound great, but it assumes that you select the right client. So let's talk a little bit about your marketing. Like I mentioned before, you guys have done a really great job with this. So was there a specific channel at the time that was leading to this? Or do you want to just jump into, we can just start talking about like one of them. So I think, I mean, what helped us the most in the very beginning. So when I first came to Single Grain, we're getting about 4,000 visits a month to the site which was like really not much. Our inbound machine just wasn't working at all. And to be frank, and everyone knows this, all the previous partners do, that the agency was really built off of the shoulders of Neil driving a ton of leads. At least when I got there, most of the leads were coming from him. And so I decided to shut the leads down. Probably not a good decision because we were struggling. (laughs) And uh, so because I just don't want to rely on him 100%. And he understood that. And so we started building up a lot of our SEO through a lot of guest posting. So we did a ton of guest posting, mainly for the backlink, the, the, the domain authority coming from the backlinks. And then we started publishing it more consistently. So we're talking you know, one or two times a week. And it's like the standard content marketing playbook. The only difference is that you know, we stuck with it a lot longer, right? Even till nowadays, like when I look at our Google Analytics, it was just slow, boring growth. Like it's not like the hockey stick stuff you see in TechCrunch. And that's the stuff that works really well. Like even podcasting, it's slow, boring growth. So, you know, SEO content that worked out really well for us in the beginning. And then from there, we started to diversify into other areas. Okay. So you're publishing once or twice a week on your own blog. How often are you doing the guest blogging? Yeah. So the guest blogging, we were really aggressive in the beginning because I think you start to hit diminishing returns. So I think if you're starting out, you try to maximize one tactic and then perhaps you move on to the next one. And some stuff is more evergreen like blogging, for example, but the guest posting stuff starts to kind of wear. And then it's not like you get a lot of traffic from the guest posts. You're more going for the link equity. That was about, I think we'd aim for at our height, we're doing like 15 to 20 a month. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then what was that strategy like? Were you literally just going out searching for people that accept guest blogs and just trying to get on as many as you can? So for us, I think because we are a marketing agency and we write about marketing all the time, it's very easy to just go to you know marketing-related websites. 
software example, like could be like lead quizzes, or it could be like HubSpot, for example. And a lot of them accept guest posts already. And there's a lot of lists out there that you can just search around. And then you'll find like these Google Sheets that show everywhere that accepts guest posts. And we just worked off of that. And then we had a lot of people kind of doing the outreach as well. Okay, awesome. And did you guys start the Growth Everywhere podcast around like the same time you joined? Yeah, so that was a terrible decision. Basically, a few months to me joining, this is before the Tim Ferriss podcast. I was like, you know what? It would be really interesting if there was like Mixer G was out already. So I was like, can we do like a Mixer G, but I get to interview people and then really dive into how they do their marketing. I think that would be a unique spin on things. And then, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. The single grain, 4,000 visits a month, which is not much. The same podcast I started after the first year. I was only getting nine downloads a day. I was spending six hours editing each podcast interview, doing the interviews. And I probably should have not done it because I was trying to save single grain, but I kept going. Hmm. Okay. All right. So let's talk about like, just let's just pick, I guess, one of these channels. So you do guest blogging for a while. You feel like you start to hit some diminishing returns and then you start doing this one to two times a week publishing. So how long does that take you before you grow this 4,000 visitors a month, which Probably a lot of agencies around that two, two to 4,000 without very much effort, I would think. How long does mm-hmm. it take you to get start getting to some significant numbers where you're generating your own leads and getting in front of these $5,000 a month retainer clients? So I think, because I joined in 2013, so probably a year and a half, I would say, to you know start to get the flywheel moving. I wouldn't even say it's working completely, but it's like, oh, look at this lead. Like There's this really big email marketing company over here. They just reached out and they found us through SEO. And then, you know, we just kept at it and it just kept growing and growing. And it, last year at this time, we're probably around 52,000 visits a month. Now we're about 110,000 visits a month. And then once you get to a certain volume, it just becomes a numbers game where, you know, we're pretty confident we can get it now to 250 then to 500 a month. Awesome. We'll get back to the show in a minute. But first, a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. All right. So last year, you guys are at 52,000. This year, at 110,000 a month. Yeah, in terms of visits. Awesome. All right. So like anybody that's listening and like maybe they're in your shoes where they had about 4,000 visits a month, like what were you doing to like learn and figure out like what actually works for SEO? If someone is going to do this on their own, or at least know enough to maybe hire someone that's going to help them. Yeah. There's a Growth Everywhere interview I did with a guy named, he's a venture capitalist at this company called Redpoint Ventures. His name is Tomas Tungus. You can just Google Tom Tungus. You can spell it that way. So T-O-M space T-U-N-G-U-Z and Google just content marketing. He wrote this one piece and there's actually these beautiful graphs about the effect of evergreen content versus temporal content. Temporal content, for example, could be like news content or you know hooking onto a trend. Now, I would recommend that you write evergreen content and then use Brian Dean's skyscraper technique, which is just trying to write really epic pieces of content. And then from there, over time, if you don't have a backlink profile, doing the outreach, doing the guest post stuff, doing the stuff that nobody wants to do to get the flywheel going, then from there, you go on this you know, six to 12 month journey, you start to see things work. <laughs> Okay. So like after like you did this for a year and a half, do you remember like how far that got you from like 4,000? Yeah. So I think we jumped to about, I want to say maybe 15 or 20,000 visits a month. Okay. Yeah. I asked because I want people to get an idea. Like this does take a lot of time and effort, but it is something that you said, like it's not temporal, it compounds. So like an article you're writing a year ago is still ranking and bringing in leads, but I'll give you an example. I mean, sure. like we have this one post that was originally getting 700 visits a month, which is decent for a blog post. And then we looked at it, and we're like, man, why don't we just add more content to it? Because Wikipedia, their users are adding content to stuff all the time. That's why it's ranking well. 
So we added like a little content to it, maybe like a couple hundred words or so, maybe two, 300 words. That post jumped up to 2,800 visits a month. We did the same thing a couple months later. It jumped up to 5,400 visits a month. And then we did it again. And it's now getting 10,000 visits a month. Wow. That's good. And then especially for an agency, I think like it's, you know, starting out, if you go from 4,000 to 6,000, like you said, you start to get a lead here and a lead there. Like if you have a high ticket service, you can start to at least see that ROI. It's a little bit faster than maybe someone that's selling like a low ticket product. 100%. Okay. All right. So you hit that strategy. Let's talk about the podcast. So you started out like nine downloads a day. That's probably pretty frustrating and pretty hard to continue with. So like, how did you get through that and actually like accelerate it and grow it where you guys are getting over 80,000 a month now with growth everywhere? Yeah, honestly, the downloads didn't matter that much to me at the time because to me, I felt like I was cheating because I was getting to talk to world-class entrepreneurs. I was really learning a lot too. Like in the first year, you'd probably listen to some questions I'd ask. A lot of them were really kind of questions designed to help me solve the problems that I was facing as I was trying to save the agency. So it was a lot of free advice I was getting. Mm -hmm. I happened to join EO at the same time that year. Like when the company was literally failing, I just joined EO at that time. And that was probably the only time I'd be able to join because the revenues were poor for like the next two years after. So I got a lot of help. And what I like to say is there's this guy, I forgot what his name is, but I was reading a post and I was like, man, this makes sense. He's like, man, you know, when you guys are looking to build an audience initially, you're really not looking at the traffic that much. Like obviously you want it to trend up, but you're looking for the unsolicited response rate. So these are the people that are tweeting at you or emailing you, telling you and thanking you about your content, right? So I had people reaching out saying, man, I don't know why you're not getting more listens or this doesn't have more reviews, but this has really changed my life. And that's what really kept me going. Yeah, that's good. And then I remember hearing uh, the guy from Art of Charm, he talked about like, before, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, like think about if you could do this like every single day and you didn't get any downloads, would you still do it? And if that's the case, mm-hmm. then it's probably something that you should look at. Yeah. Okay. So you started putting out really good content. I love that you're starting to get free advice. I've done the same thing. It's a really great way to connect with people. Mm-hmm. But how did you start to grow? Was it completely through word of mouth or did you start using some strategies to get it to grow faster? So when I first started the podcast, I remember, I think Andrew Warner had this thing. I should probably tell him that I did this, but I managed to find his Interview Your Heroes podcast course on some like kind of site. I downloaded it illegally, basically. And then I listened to it and he's like, yeah, you know what you do when you interview these people, you get to kind of siphon off their audience because they're going to share it. Da, da, da. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. People are going to share it to their email list. They're going to share it everywhere. I'm going to become a superstar. Yeah, totally didn't happen. Okay, so here's one hack I use that is probably no longer doable. We grew it to about, I want to say 15, 20,000 listens a month or so. But what happened was Product Hunt came out with a podcast section and we just started to abuse that every single day. And the downloads just started compounding and getting bigger and bigger. I think that's what helped it with the discoverability. And it kind of just stayed there afterwards. So it's not really something you can do nowadays. But I think maybe if you looked at continuing to engage with certain communities, I did try Reddit for a while too where I wasn't just posting the link to the interview itself, but I was actually engaging with people in the community saying, hey, okay, here's my thoughts around, you know, the issue you're facing right now. I actually did an interview with someone around this. Is it okay if I share it? And then they'll say yes. And then you share it. And that's how we start to get kind of more listens too. So you start to build that flywheel that way. Okay. So that was this you doing like all this hustle or did you kind of put some of these systems together and then scale it with some kind of virtual assistant? Oh, always, 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 always. I'm all for, you know, delegating and, you know, building systems around it. Same thing with the podcast nowadays. You know, we have a show notes person. We have people that transcribe it, the people that will edit it. Once we drop it in the Dropbox, it's done. Okay. Awesome. All right. So you guys have grown that pretty substantially. And then what about marketing school? So you mentioned uh, to me before marketing school is getting over 680,000 downloads a month. Mm -hmm. Now I think you guys are putting out one every single day. So yeah, that makes it a little bit faster. But what were some of the strategies that you guys used to grow that? Actually, you know what? If I were to go back in time, this will probably be more helpful for your audience than like the stuff I just gave right now. Okay. Publish every single day. That's how you do it. That's how you can get your downloads up and then you can charge more for advertising if you so want to do that. Now, for marketing school, that manifested because I would just keep telling Neil how the podcast has been so beneficial. I'm like, man, I get these you know, speaking gigs. I get to meet people I otherwise would have never met before. So I get, kept talking about it. And then one day he just turned to me. He's like, okay, fine, let's do it. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, let's do the podcast. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, you said you want to do a podcast. I was like, I didn't say that. <laughs> I mean, he kind of just manifested this idea in his head because I just kept talking about how great it is. <laughs> so it became this podcast thing. And then without going too much into it, I mean, the name came behind. He's like, you know what? We should call it B-School. I was like, well, Marie Forleo has this B-School thing. So we should call it Marketing School. So we both kind of came up with a name that's been two years in the running and it's been going ever since. 
Awesome. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I read something else that Lewis House said where he did the same thing. He started out with once a week and then he like he saw that it was, you know, doing well. And so he went to two times a week. Now he's up to probably four times a week with the podcast, if not more. Yeah. And plus, I mean, they're not all the same. You know, he has like short ones too, like short mini episodes for like two to five minutes or so. So mm-hmm. that's an option. Awesome. So you're growing some of these channels. So how's that working? Or is, is it just driving more and more leads and you guys are starting to scale the agency or what are you guys doing from here? Yeah, good question. I think this is both for Neil and I. I think right now, and I was actually talking with the CEO of a very popular talent agency here in LA yesterday. And he's like, just to go into our conversation yesterday, I mean, he was like, you know, the whole world is going back into influencers, specifically celebrities. So you look at the Gary V style of doing things, the more mind share we can build, the more we're able to kind of, you know, deploy help for whatever the audience needs. So that's what we're just trying to do right now. You know, we want to get the podcast to a million downloads first and then go for 2 million. Neil has his agency. I have mine. We both have our own software. We're both working on different initiatives. So our, our kind of thing right now is like, let's not even try to monetize it. And if we did try to monetize it, we'd make some good money on it. But you know, if we want to play the long game with it, we just want to continue to build audience. Okay. Awesome. All right. So that sounds good. So you've been building up like a lot of inbound, like you've been getting a lot more leads through this. Let's see. So your agency... You were able to grow. So like last year, you guys did $2 million in revenue. So what is the strategy now? And you guys are going on track for $4 million this year. Mm-hmm. What was the strategy to go from like, you guys have this paid advertising model, you're growing these different channels, and then bridging that to like this 2 or $4 million? Yeah. So I mean, it's always the boring stuff, right? That really helps move the needle. So what I mean by that is... You know, people are like, oh, you got to stick with it long term and then you're going to get there. And then you, know, you really got to hire great people. And that's, I mean, I continue to kind of just be wowed by the amazing, and everyone, everyone says they have amazing people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I truly think it's really not so much me. It's just, I've gotten better at picking people out. I would say that the one tactical thing to share with people is that I read this book called Rocket Fuel from Gina Wickman, and maybe you might have read it too, but it's, you know, the concept of having a visionary and an integrator. And I was like, man, I really need this integrator. And I had one for a while. He's actually a buddy of mine and I help him with his business still. But our current integrator we have right now has just been great in terms of taking things off my plate and helping me get my ideas through because I just like constantly starting things and I constantly like coming up with new ideas. I think that was a game changer because now I can really focus on strategy. So now I can look at, you know, how do WPPs and Adensus, you know, these large agencies, how do they do, they do billions in revenue? It's certainly not just, you know, doing this small kind of, you know, executional stuff for paid advertising. You know, they actually do a lot of research and they do a lot of creative ideation and that's why they get paid so much money. So because I've been able to free up my time, I've been able to, you know, do this kind of stuff and it's been able to make a really big impact on the business because once I know what to do, I just know where to go find the right people and I know, you know, how to hire better. And then they're deployed in the company. That's it. Hmm, Interesting. So I'm curious, like, are you going and like testing some of the strategy yourself? Or are you just coming up with these ideas and then the integrators making the plan and putting like the people on it? Yeah. So let's see. We really need a content manager at the time because a lot of the strategy was just being executed by me and a bunch of contractors. We got to where we got, but I mean, ultimately I had other things to do. So we, we hired a content manager and she was able to deploy a lot of my, I was like, man, we need to upgrade content more. We need to write more evergreen stuff. And then basically all the tactics and strategies were already just, you know, set and ready to be deployed, but I just didn't have time to do it. So she came in, you know, we vetted her really well. Traffic is continuing to stack right now. We're growing like 20% month over month, and I'm hoping to accelerate that growth. And she's also helped, you know, launch our course initiative too, which we plan to bundle with the software. So now I'm able to actually execute on these strategies where, you know, when I talk to one of the co-founders of ClickFunnels, I get the strategy. I know it works. I know we can do it. Now we have the resources in place and now I can deploy it where I know that even though we're on track agency for 4 million, I know very quickly we can get to 10, even 20 or so deploying it for, you know, the software, the education stuff and the agency. Okay. And so I'm curious, like with the hire like this with the content manager, it sounds like you have some specific strategies that you know work, but you just need like more capacity to fulfill them. So how much do you expect from like a hire like that where mm-hmm. they just execute on what you're giving them versus they're coming up with ideas themselves to help improve it? That's a really good question. So I think I have these strategies in my mind. What I'm looking for when I interview them is looking for them to wow me and, and you know teach me something I don't know ultimately, right? Because I don't want to be the smartest guy when it comes to you know executing on the content. We need to hire people that are smarter than us. So I might give something and then you know hope that they challenge me. And then we'll, what we'll also do is we'll, we'll give them a paid assignment as well and, and see how they do it. And so this person passed with flying colors and that's how we ultimately made the hire. Awesome. 
Another thing I'm interested in learning from you, Eric, is how are you setting and managing client expectations? I think this is something that's like really difficult for agencies. So how are you guys doing that, bringing them in and then, you know, being able to keep a client for, you know, up to 18 months like you're talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, what I've realized, and I actually did the, these customer personas even three years ago, even nowadays, when I talk to a lot of people, and I was actually looking at Reddit the other day, so just to give you an example, this guy was saying like, why do people work with agencies? And one guy responded, he's like, hey, I work at a Fortune 10 company and I actually manage six agencies and we actually pit them against each other sometimes. And the real value that we get from the agencies is what I mentioned earlier, it's the research, right? And what does research mean? It means going through a bunch of the, like how management consulting companies will come up with a bunch of research like decks and all this stuff and then use that information to come up with different ideas. And those ideas are, you know, lead to game-changing campaigns. That's where the true value is with agencies. So I already forgot the original questions, forgot where I was going with this. So can you refresh the question? Yeah, it's about client expectations and how you're setting those. Yeah. Okay. So I think the main thing for us is what I realize is when we are constantly bringing new ideas to the table where the client doesn't need to think of them and they think of us more as these guys are smart. These guys are the extended arm of our marketing team versus just a vendor. That's when the relationship lasts a lot longer. And that's when we, you know, we fly over to them, we strategize with them, and we also provide additional value. Like I'm always making introductions to clients and things like that. I'm not so much client facing, but when I'm in the city, it's like I'll go and visit them and all that. But for me, again, I think for any CEO of a services company, I think eventually you have to take yourself out of that stuff and then just focus on the big picture. Okay. Awesome. So we're kind of wrapping up here. So let's get through some quick questions. Eric, what's the one thing like looking back? that you felt like had the biggest impact on your growth? You know what? I think Neil and I talked about this and this is the same thing for like, oh, how do you get to hundreds of thousands of downloads a month? And I think there's really no one moment. I think everything compounds upon itself. Even when you asked earlier, I changed like, I don't know, nine jobs or so. I just never stayed beyond like a couple months. (laughs) This kind of ties in with the book that I'm writing. It's just, you're constantly trying to level up and look for the next opportunity. But every single thing helps build you into the person that you are today. So I have no regrets for anything. I think everything certainly built me up to where I am today. I would say tactically, because I know people like tactics, is to just you know constantly be... I'm not going to use the word networking. I think the biggest impact for me when I think about things like I was at that lunch yesterday, I was at a dinner like on Tuesday, and even like meeting with you in Arizona, for example, it's people. It's people in terms of you know everyone has something that can get you what you want. So whether it's people on your team, or it's people around you in terms of relationships, I think building really strong relationships, you know, going wide first, like with the podcast, and then, you know, looking for people that you think would be friends with you for like the long term that you'd love to hang out with, Mm. then going even deeper on that. I think that's what ultimately is going to help you hit whatever goals you want. And I truly think that, look, if there's billionaires out there, like they are no different than you. If they can do it, why can't you do it? Sure. Awesome. That's great advice. Eric, what's been an area that you've personally had to like evolve to grow your business? Yeah. Even now, I think it's focus. I think, you know, the visionary type of people, and there's a rocket fuel test to see if you're a visionary or an integrator. Entrepreneur, especially, and probably for you too, I suspect, maybe not you, but they like to jump around. Oh, here's a new shiny object. Here's a new shiny object. But just focusing in on what you're good at or your area of expertise, that pays off in the long run. Because like, for example, I tried to start a senior living business with a couple of high school friends a couple of years ago. And that totally didn't relate to what I was already building on, which is in marketing. But I found that like, you know, launching our software in private beta a couple months ago, easy, right? It's growing, it's growing. And I can see that easily getting it to to seven figures plus easy, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the marketing education stuff that we're doing. So I think staying in your lane and then focusing and then getting the right people to help you. And if you want to work on a bunch of other projects, continue to get integrators or GMs to help you and fill those positions. Yeah, great advice. Sounds like Rocket Fuel is a good resource. Uh, also, Dan Sullivan, he talks about unique ability. It would be a great resource to look into this as well. All right, Eric, if you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? And I asked this question not to say like, what would you do differently, but maybe like it's a different perspective of how you would look at things. So what would you tell yourself? I think A, travel. I think it gives a lot of perspective. And I think I've seen that this play over and over and over. I mean, even with our YouTube channel right now, it's at about like, you know, we're about to hit 9,000 subscribers. It's taking forever, but I know that it's going to start to you know, ramp up just like the first podcast did, just like the second podcast, just like our blog traffic did, just like our revenues. Everything just takes time. And I think the wisdom I'll give to myself is that you, know, you can't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 25. You just have to play your own journey and then just you know, continue to pick up power-ups along the way and just continue to grow. Yeah, that's great advice. And then so finally, Eric, Thank you so much for coming on today. Where can people learn more about Single Grain, 
or your podcasts? Yeah, sure. So you can go to singlegrain.com. Actually, both of the podcasts are on there under the podcast section, but the podcast, the one with Neil is called Marketing School. That's every single day. There's a new one. And then the other one is called Growth Everywhere. And then you know, that one's every single week. Yeah. And they're both great podcasts. I was just listening to Marketing School yesterday and it's easy to just binge through and get some like really good tactics and growth everywhere. Thanks. I think Eric, you're probably over 300 episodes now. It's just like incredible people. So both really, really good podcasts. Appreciate it. And finally, Eric, like where's a great place if people want to connect with you or learn more? Yeah. You know what? I'm trying to build up the Instagram right now. I'm kind of proud of this blue check mark I got. So Eric Osus, it's E-R-I-C, O as in orange, S as in sugar, I-U. Awesome. All right. We'll get that linked up in the show notes. Eric, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your journey to seven figures. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Eric Sue and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash 21. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a free trial to lead quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Next week, I'll be interviewing Garrett Moon on how he built co-schedule to seven figures, 1.5 million monthly page views, and over 350,000 email subscribers. Please subscribe to our show so you don't miss this next episode. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.